I'll say one more thing about trust that's very much worth knowing. So, this is what you learn if you're a clinician. Most people who trust are naive. And naive is not a virtue. It's a fault. It's partly a fault because if you're naive and you run into someone who's malevolent, including you, they might do you incalculable damage so that you will never recover. So that's not a good thing. You don't want to be naive. If you're not naive, that means you've been burned once or twice or three or four times. And, you know, once you've been burned in that manner, well, then it's hard to trust. Because you think, well, why would I trust you or me, for that matter, knowing full well that I can be betrayed? And so then you're cynical. And you think, that's an improvement over being naive. You know, it's, you're more mature cynical than you are naive, even if it's premature. And it's often premature in young people. It's like, okay, so how do you get out of that conundrum? Well, this is a crucial thing to know. You trust people because you're courageous. That's why. It's the same reason that you're grateful. It's a mark of courage. It's a mark of commitment. It's like, you and I, we're going to make an agreement. And you're full of snakes, and so am I. And there's lots of ways this can go sideways. But we're going to put together an agreement. We're going to articulate it out. We're going to try to find something that is of mutual benefit to both of us. We're going to put our hands out and shake, and we're going to try to stick to that. And we're going to risk trusting each other. Right? It's a risk. And that's the risk upon which the state is based. Really. Like, I, I believe, and I think the evidence for this is very strong, by the way. I don't think that there is any other natural resource than trust. And for trust, you need courage, not naivety. And you've got to overcome your cynicism so that you trust. And then you ask yourself, too, if you don't trust your institutions, it's like, hey, they're your institutions. Mm. Why don't you go out and do something about them? You think, well, I can't. It's like, that's not true. That is, that is absolutely not true. That, that's, there's, there's nothing vaguely accurate about that in a society like this. Almost all of our democratic institutions are crying out for people to participate. They can't find enough people to do it. And if you participate and you, and, and you do it diligently and you have your say and you're careful and trustworthy and you speak your mind, you can have way more effect than you think. So, if you're cynical about the institutions, it's like, look in the mirror. Because those institutions, the corruption of those institutions is a direct reflection of your inability to get your act together. And that's what it means to be a sovereign part of the Western community. So, it's not someone else. So, what makes you think you're smart enough to pull off something like that? It's very, very difficult. Very, very, very difficult. To take a system that works not too badly and to do anything to it that doesn't make it worse. Much less to radically reconstitute it and make it better. That's really hard. So, you know, if you're upset about your culture, well, maybe you could think of some small ways that are local that you could go out and improve it. I think you should start with yourself. Because, well, then you're only harming yourself and you're not a bad person to practice on. And then you could extend that to your family. Well, at least you suffer for the consequences of your own experiments that way, rather than having someone else do it. And then maybe you can work on bringing a little more harmony into your family. And maybe you can get a job and see if you're any good at that. And then if you manage those three things halfway respectably, well, then you could dare to put a toehold out into the broader community and think, Maybe I have an idea here that we could tentatively attempt that might make some small thing slightly better that we could measure carefully and assess. And that would be your contribution. And, and maybe you get real good at that, you know? So by the time you're 50 or 60 and you have a solid life behind you, you're actually capable of generating large-scale improvements. Carefully. It's necessary to separate the wheat from the chaff. You know, one of the things I see with readers who are... Um, unsophisticated and intellectually arrogant is they'll read someone great maybe they'll read Nietzsche for example and they'll find the odd thing that Nietzsche said that grates against their current moral sensibilities um, whether they do that in context or out and then they'll throw away the whole book it's like you don't throw away the whole book it was Nietzsche you don't throw away the book He's like one in a billion. You read it carefully and you think, well, 
okay, no to that. But yes to this, and you do the same thing with Dostoevsky, and you do the same thing with Tolstoy, you do, you do the same thing with the great writers of the past that have been passed down to us. You, you read intelligently, you separate the wheat from the chaff, right? And you gain wisdom that way. Well, you do the same when you look at your own history. It's like, well, of course it's a bloody nightmare. What, what do you expect? It's like, what's your point? We're going, to, we're going to burn it down and, and then we're going to have something better as a consequence? Well, not so easily, not so quickly. Maybe we read our history carefully. And we think, okay, well, what did we get right? Well, what did we get right? Well, the sovereignty of the individual, that's pretty good. The fact that you have right to property, that's pretty good. You can argue about the limits on that, but, you know, you don't want someone just taking your purse. You know, it's, it's, it's helpful that there are things that you can earn and own. You know, the dignity of the individual, that's another one. Um, the innocence before the law, God, that's, that's a miracle that we ever came up with that idea. I, I can't believe that that idea exists, because in most cultures it's like, well, you might be guilty, okay, you're dead. Because, well, that's easier, you might be guilty, you know, why go through all the trouble? There's plenty of people where you came from. It's like the trouble of presuming your innocence, it's e innocent, it's even hard for you to do that for yourself. And, and, and the idea that, that each person has an intrinsic worth regardless of their, well, externalities, let's say. That's another idea that's a complete miracle. It's like, what, what are we going to do? We're going to throw all that away with the statement that we live in an oppressive patriarchy. And then we're going to be left with nothing. And, and, and what, what good is that? Well, how about we look at our history and we take responsibility for it. We think, okay, well, here's some things that need to be fixed. There's plenty of them. Right? There's plenty of them for each of us to fix. And we'll go fix them. And maybe then we can atone for the bloodiness of our history and for our so-called unearned privilege, you know? Some of which all of us have. And, and that would be good. That would be part of the adventure of your life too. And that's, that's a far more sensible and wise approach to the diagnosis of what's wrong with the West than well, it's an oppressive patriarchy and it should be overthrown or whatever that, you know, current uh, low resolution and resentful ideology happens to be. You have intrinsic value. And even if you do something terrible, let's say, and I still have the, the conviction that you have value, then it's incumbent on me to say, well, you did something terrible, but you aren't necessarily something terrible. And it might be possible for you to shed that and to atone and to rejoin those who are good. And that's something too, and that's built deeply into our political and economic and justice systems. And it's, it's no time to be abandoning this, you know? Especially when you look around the world, you see as it's spreading, and it's spreading quite rapidly, everywhere it's spreading, things are getting way better. So, enough crisis of confidence in the West. Like, we've got our house to put in order, there's no doubt about that, but I see no reason why we can't do it, unless we lose faith in ourselves. And, and there's reason for that, like, life is brutal, there's reason to lose faith, but not in the final analysis, it's, it's a mark of... It's a mark of malevolence and cowardice, to lose faith. Without truth, you don't have the adventure of your life. You see, because if you tell the truth, that means you're revealing your being. That's what you're doing when you're telling the truth. And when you, when you reveal your being, then you're, you're living in the world. You're there, you're present, right? You're, 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 that's being there, let's say. That's you. That's your destiny. That's your journey. That's your adventure. That's what's going to justify your life. The adventure. It's not going to be easy. But, and if you hide from your truth, well, then you hide from yourself. And then you're not even there. And then who the hell are you? What are you? The puppet. You're the puppet of some coward. You're the puppet of some dictator or some second-rate philosopher, some idiotic idea or, or a bully you were afraid of in grade six. God only knows. But it's not you living your life. And then you lose your life. And you lose your soul, too. So, that's what I'm afraid of. And so, you know, journalists, well, they try to take me down. It's like, yeah, well, that's annoying, and it usually takes me three days to recover, but compared to 
not having my life and, 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 and not saying what I have to say, that's, that's nothing. It's, it's nothing. It's, it's minor inconvenience. And, and then generally, if you, can, if you can just withstand it, you know, two weeks, you get mobbed. You guys might all need to know this. You're going to get mobbed on social media. Okay, so what do you do? Unless you did something wrong. Don't apologize. That's the first thing, because then no one can come to your defense. So don't apologize. Maybe you even double down carefully. Carefully. Not vengefully, right? Carefully. You say, no, that's what I meant. And if you don't like it, too bad. And you get mobbed. Then you apologize, a different mob comes after you. That's not helpful and no one can defend you. If you can hold out for two weeks, you'll win. Now, it's a pretty brutal two weeks because, you know, if you're a reasonable person and a hundred angry neighbors show up at your door with pitchforks, you might be thinking there's something wrong with you, you know, like you think that unless you're psychopathic and you think, well, maybe I made a mistake and it's easy to waver and to, and to back down and maybe you're also afraid. But, you know, if you scoured your conscience and you're careful and you said what you had to say, then leave it lie. And, if, and they'll throw, the people who are playing this game will throw everything they can at you for two weeks. And if it doesn't stick, you're done. And then the next time they try it, it doesn't work as well as it did the first time. And by the 50th time they try it, like as far as I can tell, Carefully The people who have enmity for me are out of ammunition They're done. I read hit pieces now, and I think oh you just copied the hit piece from two months ago. It's like hmm. I'm Perfectly habituated to that they're out of ammunition and maybe you know like someone creative could still come up with some more ammunition maybe that'll happen at the Q&A, but <laughs> it's not bravery, man. It's faith in the, in the redeeming power of truth, and that's different. Solzhenitsyn, at one point, noticed that there were people in the camps whose comportment he truly admired, who seemed incorruptible, who wouldn't deceive or lie or take the easy way out, regardless of what it was that they were being threatened with. And they wouldn't sign the confessions that everybody had to sign guilty or not guilty, they refused to play along. And some of them certainly died for that, but many people died in the gulags, so that was hardly um, an anomaly. But he said that many of them, many of the people who ran the camps were terrified by these people. And that also that many of them were religious believers, which was quite interesting. And so what he learned was that even under terrible circumstances, there were ways of being more or less noble 